Let me add my word of welcome to those of you who are guests on our campus. We're delighted that you're here and we'll look forward to spending more time with you this afternoon. Stephen Lawson, in a recent book decrying our low views of God, called Made in Our Image, reports a story that took place with a former pastor of the historic 10th Presbyterian Church in downtown Philadelphia, Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse. One of the great Bible teachers of the 20th century, an alumnus of Princeton Theological Seminary, Early in his ministry, he was invited back to speak in chapel. As Barnhouse stood to preach, Dr. Robert Dick Wilson, one of the renowned professors at Princeton, and a brilliant scholar, took his seat in the front row, which the young preacher found somewhat intimidating. Understandably, Barnhouse felt fear and trepidation about teaching the scriptures in the presence of those who had taught him. At the close of the message, Dr. Wilson approached Barnhouse and announced, if you come back again, I'll not ever hear you preach. Barnhouse collapsed on the inside. How had he failed? Was his theology wrong? Was his use of the original languages improper? With all the courage he could muster, the young preacher asked the aged professor, where, where did I fail? Fail? Wilson replied, oh, you didn't fail. I only come to hear a former student once. I only want to know if he's a big godder or a little godder. And then I'll know how his ministry will be. When his former student asked for an explanation, Wilson answered, Some men have a little god and they're always in trouble with him. Uh, he can't do any miracles. He can't take care of the inspiration and the transmission of the scriptures. He doesn't in intervene on behalf of his people. They have a little god and I call them little godders. There are others who have a great God, Wilson continued. He speaks and it's done. He commands and it stands fast. He knows how to show himself strong on behalf of them that fear him. You are a big godder, he told Barnhouse, and he'll bless your ministry. He paused, he smiled, and he walked out. What a lesson for Barnhouse, and what a lesson for us. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. A.W. Tozier says in his book, A Knowledge of the Holy, what a person thinks about God is the most important thing about him. What a person thinks about God is the most important thing about us. Are you a big godder or are you a little godder? Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, The highest science, the loftiest speculation, the mightiest philosophy, which can ever engage the attention of a child of God, is the name, the nature, the person, the work and doings, and the existence of the great God whom he calls his father. Packer, in his book, Knowing God, said, a, knowledge of the, a lack of the knowledge of God is the reason why our faith is so feeble and our worship is so flabby. It was the 8th century B.C. It was a time of political change. The culture, as in our day, is in moral crisis. There was a lack of spiritual leadership. There was an empty throne after the 52-year reign, the longest in the history of God's people, when a leprous king, intoxicated by his own imaginations, made the initiative as a king to take over the role of priest. It was an end of an era, a 52-year golden year reign. Of Isaiah. The vision to Isaiah is dated with that incredible reminder in the king, in the year that King Isaiah died. And there needs to be in that phrase all of the backdrop of why. Fifty-two years. 
and he ended in disgrace. He ended in personal failure. In spite of economic and political successes, he ended with an empty throne and the intrusion of a human king into the sacred priesthood. And he had to experience the judgment of God. Uzziah may have reigned long and well, but he ended poorly because he dared to think, he dared to think that he, rather than God, knew what was right and wrong. What a person thinks about God is the most important thing about him. In this passage, which is a familiar passage to many, we have a vision of God. It's the only vision of its kind in the, all of the book of Isaiah. In the year that King Isaiah died, I, I saw the Lord, Adonai, sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Uh, there's a throne, there's a train, and there are attendants. Uh, the throne speaks of God's position. He's high, he's lifted up, there's exalted royalty. The train speaks of his all-consuming presence, filling the temple, not just dragging down the aisle, but filling the temple. Extended majesty to match exalted royalty. And then there are these attendants, seraphim, burning ones, literally, stood before him, each having six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. If the throne is exalted royalty and the train is extended majesty, then the attendance, there's some excited activity. Uh, they, they covered their face, I take it, out of reverence, not worthy to see the image that was in front of them. With two, they covered their feet with great humility, not worthy to stand in his presence. And with two, they flew. Not worthy to see, not worthy to stand, but absolutely willing to serve. Their excited activity. Don't miss this. I, I love this in Scripture. I love to see the worship of angels, especially in light of how long they have been with God. They still have not gotten over God. You see it here, you'll see it in Revelation, when the myriads of myriads, thousands and thousands, are before the throne of God, and they're still awestruck by an awesome God, which tells me something about our future that for eternity, we'll never get used to him. We'll never get over him. And we will forever worship him. The angels are still impressed. Don't you love that? A vision of God is viewed perspectively. God is high, but the vision of God is also viewed personally. God is holy. His highness speaks of his sovereignty. His holiness speaks of his sanctity. Look at verse 3. And one called out to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled or full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Just like there was a throne and a train and the attendants, as we are given a glimpse through Isaiah's eyes of God perspectively, so there are shouts and there are shakes and there is smoke as we view God personally. God is holy. Holy is one of the favorite expressions of Isaiah for God and for the coming Messiah. Twenty-nine times he refers to God or his servant as the Holy One of Israel. Uh, kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. Holy, holy, holy. 
While some have seen this as a reference to Trinity, I I don't think that's the primary implication. A threefold repetition is because in in Hebrew there's no superlative kind of expression other than by comparison. And so if you wanted to say that this particular ground is the holiest of all grounds, you would say it is the holy of, say it, holies. If uh, there is going to be ruin, as Ezekiel predicts, in Ezekiel 21, at the fall of Judah and the loss of that Davidic kingdom reigning uh, in Israel until Messiah would come, uh, there is a phrase in Ezekiel 21, 27, a ruin, a ruin, a ruin. When there is an announcement of the coming exile to Babylon and Jeconiah is cursed, until God would restore that signet ring to the messianic line. Jeremiah twenty two twenty nine. Oh, earth, earth, earth. It is a repetition for emphasis. It's a repetition for intensity. And if you wanted to say that Jesus is the best king of all the kings, you would say he is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. But if you wanted to take it one more step in describing God as holy, It's the only attribute in all of the Bible that is used in a threefold repetition to describe God. Some have therefore seen holiness as the central unifying attribute because if God is holy, then all other attributes and their expressions are holy as well. The shouts... Stephen Sharnock, who wrote a book back in the 1600s called The Existence and the Attributes of God that was published after his death. If you need some nighttime reading, it will keep you busy. There are only 80 pages on the holiness of God. Sharnock says, The threefold repetition of a word notes the certainty, the absoluteness of the thing, or the irreversibleness of the resolve. Holy, holy, holy. Its root idea, holy, doesn't mean just moral purity, though it has a resultant implication. Be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. But when we talk about the holiness of God, we're talking about the difference of God. He's unique. He's separate. He's just special. Don't be a low godder. Let's become high godders, big godders. There are shouts and then there are shakes. The, the, the word that's used here in the Hebrew is for the elbow joints, probably the receptive bases into which the steps and the, the door plugs were fitted in this temple vision. And, and, and like a, a train that comes by or a, a, a tornado that blows through or, or an earthquake that's not far away, the, the whole thing is shaking. The whole earth is full of His glory. The foundations of the thresholds trembled just at the voice of Him who called out. And the temple was filled with smoke. The physical representation, the visible representation of God's presence among His people, often present with smoke when theophany, a pre-appearance, or an earthly appearance of God took place. There's shouts, there's shakes, there's smoke. Viewed prospectively, God is high. Viewed personally, God is holy. But when there is a vision of God, there is a mirrored reflection of humanity. Warren Wiersbe put it this way, it is not enough in our worship to only see the Lord, for if we truly see Him as He is, we will also see ourselves as we are. If God is high and holy, then what must we be like? Only when you and I see God will we really understand how we are. Only God can reveal what He is like, and only God can reveal really what I am like. I don't even know what I'm like. I don't know why I think what I think at times and say what I say at times. I don't know why my emotions, my thoughts, 
my impulses come like they do. But God does. And only God can reveal God. And only God can really reveal me. If God is high and holy, then what must we be like? Well, you know the answer. Woe is me, for I am ruined. I don't know how long I had known about this passage before I realized that this is the seventh woe in a series of woes. And the other six are found in chapter 5 and may explain why, why God the Holy Spirit guided the human author Isaiah to write of his commission in chapter 6 and not chapter 1 like Jeremiah and Ezekiel. If you want to just flip back, I'm just going to mention these. In chapter 5, verse 8, there is a woe, which is a warning of judgment to come, that is announced to those who trust in their real estate for their security. The amount that one owns, woe to that person, if that's where their trust is. In 5.11, those who try to cope with the realities of life through drinking, drowning their sorrows, or celebrating their successes. Woe to those. 5.18, to those who make it a habit to sin through dishonesty and, and whatever it takes to get ahead. 5.20, to those who think it is their prerogative to establish their own morality, those who call right wrong and wrong right, who make up their own rules. In 5.21, those who view themselves as wise in their pride. Woe! To them, he says. And in 522, those who gain their self-esteem through foolish, competitive booze parties. Can you believe that? Who would ever do that? Who have competition in how much they can down. And then, as a result, lose the sense of justice and pervert it. Whoa, 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 whoa. And in light of all of that, when Isaiah sees God, he doesn't go, wow. He says, woe is me. Whether he has said something in chapters 1 through 5, something that may not be quite right, I, I think he just suddenly realizes how holy and how high God is. What am I even doing here? Being the recipient of what I see. And being the hearer of what has been said. Just as God was viewed perspectively and personally, Isaiah views himself perspectively and personally. His first statement is, I am undone. I'm ruined. I, I think his thought, like the Old Testament has taught, is that no man can see God and live, and if he has seen the, the, the image of the glory of God, then death must be soon. I, I don't have long to live. I, I'm undone. I'm ruined. That's perspectively. But personally, I'm unclean. I, I have unclean lips and I, I live among a people of unclean lips. Why lips? Why not heart? Even if we find we're not guilty of that which calls for these woeful judgments of God to come on our culture, in contrast to the seraphim, we have no right to think that our praise or our worship should find acceptance with God. I'm woefully inadequate. As I thought about speaking on Isaiah 6, I uh, had internal, not necessarily external, trembling. You may not believe this, but this is the toughest place to speak in the world. Ask my colleagues. I think it's something about the shared sacred task that we as colleagues share and the representation of God in this place where God is honored and God's word is studied and it's intimidating. But I found myself thinking, who, who am I to talk about God in this group? Who am I to talk about God in front of you students, you guests? Who would dare? <laughs> Who would dare talk and say, this is what God is like? 
if it wasn't for his spirit and if it wasn't for his word and if it wasn't for his son we would all do what I did, Isaiah did and said, I'm done. I'm not worthy. I shouldn't be here. I'll see you later. Individually, we don't qualify, but nationally, Isaiah said we don't qualify. By extension, we, within our own culture, we live among a people of unclean lips. I was uh, reading a plane on the way back from speaking at Cedarville College last week and picked up a USA Today in the airport and sat down and started reading through it. And there was a little tiny article that says, Almighty, in quotes, too powerful for Egyptians. This was our shame. Jim Carrey's Bruce Almighty is a little too much for Egypt's taste. According to Zap2IT.com, government authorities in Egypt have banned the comedy saying it infringes on God's sacredness. The state-run censorship board says the comedy in which the star plays a normal man who gets to play God for a week is blasphemous. The name of the Moody, Bruce, the name of the movie, Bruce Almighty, indicates there is someone who can do anything and everything. The censure group leader told the Associated Press such traits belong only to God. Did it bother us? Or do we live in among a culture who can talk lightly about God and who dares make a comedy? In the ancient Israel, there were three ways to commit blasphemy. One was saying that God did not possess the attributes that he possesses, taking something away from God. Another was ascribing attributes to God that were not true of God like God would be fickle or capricious, out of balance in some way. But the third was thinking that a person could share the attributes of deity. And that's why they accused Jesus of blasphemy. It wasn't because he was adding to the God or taking away from the concept of God, but because he was claiming to be God, which for him was a legitimate claim. But his name is not Bruce. We live among a people. Our hypocrisy, our hedonism, our homosexuality, rampant in the corporate world, the white-collar crime, education, entertainment, social institutions, the prejudice, the racism. We live among a people who are disqualified because of God's holiness and his greatness. Well, what do we do? The good news is that God not only has a throne, but he has an altar. You can see that in the text. And then I said, woe is me, I'm ruined. Verse 6, then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. Every day of atonement, there was uh, uh, coals taken off the altar and taken in as part of the sanctification of the Holy of Holies. So there's an image here of atonement. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, that which has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away, your sin is forgiven. Wouldn't you have loved to have been Isaiah? But listen, back then it was an angel as the agent of this atoning work of God for the moment. In the New Testament, it's Jesus, God's Son, as the personal agent of God, as God's Son Himself. There it was an altar. Later, it's a cross. There it was the atonement for Isaiah, for sins being forgiven and cleansing uh, proclaimed. Now, guilt is removed, righteousness is imparted, availability for service now becomes acceptability for worship and service because of what Christ did, you and I, 
can be available. I love that that part which is cleansed now becomes that part which is available for service in the passage. Jonathan Edwards said, Grace is but glory begun, and glory is but grace perfected. Only when we see the greatness of God will we see the greatness of our sin. And only when we see the greatness of our sin will we begin to comprehend the glory of His grace. And only when we see the glory of His grace Will we be rightly motivated for service? God needed a messenger. Isaiah said, here I am. <laughs> the nation needed God. Isaiah said, send me. And God revealed that Isaiah was not so that God could be all that God wanted to be in his life. William Temple put it this way, to worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open the heart to the love of God, to devote the will to the purpose of God. God delights in using cleansed sinners to minister God's cleansing touch to other sinners. How would you like to be called to this? Look at verse 9. And he said, Go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long do I have to serve like this? And he answered, Until the cities are devastated and without inhabitant, houses are without people, the land is utterly desolate, and the Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Yet, yet there will be a tenth portion in it. It will again be subject to burning, like the terebinth or the oak, whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. Not everyone will respond to your ministry. God basically said to Isaiah, don't let that discourage you. Judgment will one day come. Stay faithful until it does. But there will always be a remnant. God will always have his people. And that realization for us makes it worthwhile. Warren Wearsby says that Isaiah 6 is the locus classicus for the study of worship. Isaiah saw something in light of John 12, 36 to 43. It was Christ in all his glory. The New Testament says Isaiah saw Christ. He heard something, the heavenly praises. He experienced something. The cleansing power of God. And he did something. He volunteered for what was told to him as difficult service. A vision of God. A vision of ourselves. A vision for ministry. To which God calls us. Father, for our lives, we desire to be those who think you're high and those who think you're holy. And may the legacy that we leave to the next generation come from a people, your church, who has a great and grand view of you. With our mouths, we want to praise, and with our hearts, we want to obey, and that we would like to offer you. In your Son's name, who makes it all possible, amen. Lord bless you. Have a great day. You're dismissed.